In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and bless the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners, now at the hour of our death, amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created. Let us pray. O God, who did instruct the hearts of your faithful by light of the Holy Spirit, grant that by the same Spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Lady Guadalupe, <coughs> St. Joseph, Saint Andres Besset, all God's angels and saints. In the name of the Father and the Son, Lord, Spirit, Amen. Good evening and happy New Year. What I hope to do this evening is to finish up the talk that I gave, basically two talks on the church liturgical year, and I'd like to finish up on that. Uh, given that that is so so very important, we don't have a firm grasp on the church liturgical year. I think we're kind of walking um, in the dark. So a brief a brief summary, and then I'll I'll get into another dimension of the liturgical year that uh, that fascinates me, and hopefully it'll fascinate you. Can, can you hear me? Oh, okay, maybe you can turn a little bit loud. Okay. Something wrong with the mic and also with you, right? <laughs> That's the old mic joke. Huh? So, if we want to encounter Christ... We encounter Christ in the most full manner through word and sacrament, both word but also sacrament. Uh, we as Catholics were sanctified for the Protestants, it's just a word, but for us it's word and sacrament. That's a, uh, there's a big difference. When I was studying my fourth year of theology in Rome, Father Almond said, that the center of the Protestant faith is a pulpit, whereas for us it's the altar. I never forgot that, no? They've got the pulpit, but we have both the pulpit as well as the altar. So we have the Word of God, and then we have the body and blood of Christ. So we, we, we relive the life of Christ in, um, in every Mass in every church season. The church liturgical cycle is divided into three on Sunday. It's year A, B, and C. Year A would be the Gospel of St. Matthew. Year B would be Mark. Year C would be Luke. And John is interspersed during the strong times of the church here, which would be Lent and Easter. So every, every year, you're getting, so that sometimes you hear the, the complaint that everything is, everything is the same, how monotonous it, it is. Really, it's not. There's a lot of variety. A lot of variety, A, B, and C. And then during the weekday Mass, it's just odd and even. All right, so the church year starts with the season of Advent. There are four Sundays in Advent. For that reason, you see the, the Advent wreath. You have four different candles. And you've got the purple candles and you have the pink candles. Purple is symbolic of penance. Pink is symbolic of joy because Jesus is about to be born. Advent ends, it culminates 
in the celebration of Christmas, which is Christmas Eve. So Christmas Eve is December 24th, and there are actually three Christmas Masses. There's the Vigil Mass, there's the Mass at dawn, and there's the Mass during the day. And we as priests were able to celebrate Mass, three Masses for Christmas, which I always do. I said the evening Mass I can't celebrate with Father Craig, then I said my own Mass at 12 o'clock. If I, the Church allows me to say three Masses, I'll say three Masses. No? Because there's nothing greater than the Mass. <coughs> nothing greater. Okay, then we enter into Christmas season. Christmas season extends until this Sunday evening. Sunday evening, and then we enter into what is called ordinary time. We celebrate the baptism of the Lord, then we enter into ordinary time, and there are two ordinary times. They would be the short ordinary time, which lasts usually about eight or nine weeks. Then the long lasts about six months. Okay, the first ordinary time culminates, it ends rather, in the entrance into Lent with Ash Wednesday. Now, Ash Wednesday, as well as Easter, it's a it's a movable feast day. Sometimes we can actually celebrate Easter even in March. Usually it's in usually it's in um, in April. So Lent lasts forty days, and Lent culminates in Holy Week. Holy Week, the heart of Holy Week is called the Easter Triduum. Easter Triduum, Triduum means three. And that would be Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and Holy Saturday. Holy Thursday is the day in which you call to mind the institution of two sacraments, the sacrament of the Eucharist and the sacrament of holy orders. Okay, Good Friday, we contemplate the cross. People will confess that they committed a serious sin because they didn't go to Mass on Good Friday. Many people. And technically, it is a serious sin because it went against their conscience. It's a poorly formed conscience. And as a good confessor will intervene and enlighten the conscience and say, look, there's no Mass on Good Friday, there's a beautiful ceremony, but it's technically it's not a Mass. <coughs> but a lot of people believe that that's a Mass. We don't want it to be such that we're condemned because of our ignorance. No, it could be the case. We don't want to be responsible of culpable ignorance. Well-educated Catholics sh should more or less well, you're not going to understand everything that I said, but a lot of things I've, I've, I'm saying right now you've heard, but you've never heard it explained in this context. And I think you should try to memorize the whole idea of the church here. And what I'm going to give you today, well, I think you're going to love it, because it's right up the, it's right up the alley of the charism of the oblates, what I'm going to be talking about today. So Holy, Holy Week culminates in the Easter Triduum, Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday. Okay, then that night, the, the Mass, that Saturday, we enter into the celebration of the greatest solemnity in our Catholic Church. It's called the Easter and that Mass, the Vigil Mass, is the longest and the most beautiful Mass. Uh, I could very easily just take that Mass and spend a whole hour explaining the whole symbolism of all the different 
beautiful symbols you have in that mass. That's probably the celebration that's, that's jam-packed with symbols. Yeah, the Easter Vigil Mass is just, it's, it's a beautiful mass. Fortunately, a lot of us are probably tired when the Mass is going on, and we only maybe pick up about half of what's going on. But if you, you maybe take a nap and really pay attention, uh, you, you can be blown away by the utter beauty of it. You know, if, if a Mass is celebrated well, it's beautiful. I try, I try to celebrate a very dignified Mass. No? So I said the Mass that you're participating is is very beautiful. And I could give you a talk on the different times of silence in the Mass. I gave a homily on that about three months ago. So you notice there's certain times of silence, but maybe you don't know why is Father quiet now? You know, that, that silence is not a dead silence of a cemetery, it's a rich silence which is open to prayer. But different types of prayer. For example, when I sat down today for about 10 minutes after Holy Communion, those were the 10 most important minutes in your day. Now, if you didn't know that, now you know it, okay? I've told you. And, and don't look at me and say, look, Paul, pobrecito, padre, broma, está cansado, no? <laughs> you know, don't, you, you really shouldn't be looking at me anyway. You should be, you should be looking within because you've got Christ within you. you got Christ within you. When I was a lay person coming back from university, I would sometimes spend an hour in preparation for Mass, an hour in Thanksgiving, because I just, I was 20. I just reasoned. If Mass is the greatest prayer in the world, I should at least prepare for an hour, <clears throat> and then I should pre prepare, at least I should give Thanksgiving an hour. I thought, Afterward, I said, Lord, sorry I didn't give you enough time. That's probably why I'm a priest, because I understood, even when I was 20 years old, heading toward the priesthood, the value of what a Mass is. Talking with my mom the other day, and she's, uh, she goes to daily Mass, and sometimes after communion, people will come up and talk to her. And she told me, this lady came up to talk to her. She said, be quiet, I'm talking to Jesus now. <laughs> it took courage. The, per the person was dumbfounded what my mom said, but she was right. i, I got to talk to Jesus now. I'll talk to you maybe outside in the parking lot, but right now, i got to talk to Jesus. i got to talk to him. Not to talk to him at least for a few minutes is bad manners. Mal educación is in Spanish. Bad manners, no? Okay, so uh, we enter into the Easter season. Easter season lasts, Easter day lasts eight days up until Divine Mercy Sunday. Then the Easter season lasts, <coughs> lasts, 50 days. 40 days technically would be the ascension, and then we enter into the cynical with Mary and the apostles to make the first novena. And then after those nine days, we celebrate Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit, which is the birthday of the church. Pentecost is the birthday of the church. I think that's where we left off uh, two weeks ago. Let me just finish it then. Okay, then after that, you enter into ordinary time. Now, once you enter ordinary time, the second ordinary time is about six months, which usually is June all the way up until the end of November. Okay, right after ordinary time, or when you enter into ordinary time, there are three solemnities in ordinary time which are back to back to back. This is ordinary time. 
Now see how, see how wise the church is. You're, it's interesting, you're going to get the two solemnities, first two solemnities are the two most important mysteries in our Catholic faith. The greatest mystery, of course, you know it, is the Trinity, right? So we celebrate Trinity Sunday after Pentecost. That's the greatest mystery in our Catholic faith. One St. Augustine was explaining the Trinity to someone, and he said, did you understand? And he said, yes, and St. Augustine said, you're a liar. <laughs> you're a liar, because we can't fully understand it. We can understand it partially. Then after that, we celebrate the second greatest mystery, which is Corpus Christi, the body and blood of Christ. Then the Friday after that, we celebrate the sacred heart of Jesus. So those solemnities are back to back to back. <clears throat> sacred heart, which of course is the most eloquent symbol of love. Most eloquent symbol of love. Okay. So I've gone through the whole church liturgical year very quickly, well, in three classes, but there's still something missing. And that is, in the course of, it, of the church year, we also celebrate the saints, and then we celebrate also the queen of all saints, and that's Mary. So the article that I wrote yesterday, and Mary helped to format it, and uh, Elvira translated into Spanish for my class tomorrow. Uh, I'm kind. I'm really proud of this article. It really came out well. It took me took me a good block of time yesterday. I really hammered it out, and it's. Uh, I'll tell you. The, the article and my and the rest of my topic is this. Uh, in, in 1979, I entered into the seminary in Rome, which was like the transition almost when John Paul II, John Paul II was pope for about a year. So, we had John Paul I for only about a month. But, well, he's going to be beatified in September, so uh, the smiling Pope, Luciani. But before him, we have Pope Paul VI. The mo more and more, I'm really falling in love with, with Pope Paul VI because of just the, the sterling character of this man that suffered so much. Fulton Sheen talked to him and said that when, in 1968, when he published Humana Vitae, he said every night afterward he'd be reading the mail, it was hate mail. It was hate mail. And he said he'd be putting his head on what was like a crown of thorns every night. 68, he's going to be a pope another 10 years, till August 6, 1978, the Transfiguration. I think very few people knew how much, because he was very, very sensitive, you know, keen intellectual from Milan. So when I entered the seminary, uh, there was a, a group that was formed. It was a Marian group, and I was just a postulant. If you know anything about religious life, you've got postulancy. For us, it was two years. Often, it's just one year. Postulancy means you're, you're, you're trying it out. You know, see whether or not you're going to persevere. Now you're kind of trying it out, no? And then you have the novitiate, then your first vows, then you renew your vows. For us, it's three years, and then you make perpetual vows, and you ordain the diaconate, and then the priesthood. So in about two and a half weeks, we're going to have three of the men who are here visiting you over the past ten years. They're going to make their perpetual vows, and then they'll be ordained to the diaconate. Brother Leland, Jonas, and uh, Nathan. Uh, they've been with us the past 10 years, <coughs> like Brother J.R. 
So one of the uh, one of the postulants said, "Well, why don't we have a, a group in honor of Mary? Which, if we're going to be oblates of the Virgin Mary, we should probably get to know her." And I, I love the idea. So he suggested that we read <coughs> and discuss. It probably took a good year. Uh, probably, at least personally, uh, probably my, my favorite writing of Paul VI. I mean, he, he didn't write as much as John Paul II, but he wrote, and he's a very good writer. And I find him easier to understand than John Paul II, who has a much more uh, Eastern style, where you've got an idea, then you go deeper, then you go deeper. Whereas Paul the Sick is basically the way I write, I write blog articles in my books. No? Topic, catchy title, intro, then you got the body, and then the conclusion. No? Uh, that's uh, my style of writing. That's his style of writing, too. So he wrote... This is, I'm going to give you a summary of this apostolic exhortation. It's called Marialus Cultus. Marialus Cultus. Which is Latin for, it would be the, any of you know a little bit of Latin? It would be the, the cult of Mary. The cult, not in the negative sense, no? You think like a religious cult, you think of wacky people, right? No, his basic cult means devotion <coughs> to Mary. <coughs> so he wrote this uh, interesting February 2nd, when I'll be terminating my consecration to the Filipino group there in San Bernardino, 1974. Now, what does he do? So what he does, and, and invite all of you, maybe try to, try to memorize these basic themes, is Mary's presence in the liturgical year. Okay, that's the, the essence of that apostolic exhortation. The presence of Mary... Presence of Mary in the litur liturgical year. Now Mary never, Mary never places herself in front of Jesus. It's the other way around. Mary is always going to be glorifying Christ. So the holy sacrifice of the Mass is we're praising Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit, but then we have God's saints, and the greatest of all saints would be Mary. She's present in the Mass to help us to glorify Christ. So what I'm doing, I'm going to go through now at a pretty good clip so I can finish this today. The different Marian, the different Marian liturgical celebrations. Now for me as an oblate, this is right up my alley. So I was reading this, just entering in to become an oblate. I, I, I fell in love with this. No? So you might even Google in Marialis Cultus. It's not, not very long. It's easy reading. And I think you're going to fall in love with it. So that if you read that, even if you read my article, when we're celebrating Masses in honor of Mary, you'll remember this talk. And you'll remember the... Uh, the article that we're going to be giving to you. All right. Trad okay, traditionally, this is not in my blog article. It occurred to me just today that I forgot, I forgot to mention this, is that Saturday is a day in which we honor Mary. And Venerable Fultonsheen, as well as the Oblates, if we do not have an obligatory memorial on Saturdays. In ordinary time, we always celebrate the Mass in honor of Mary. Always. But 
if, say, for example, it's the feast day of St. Peter and St. Paul, no, we celebrate, that's a solemnity. We celebrate uh, the feast day of St. Barnabas, okay, that's a feast. Even the obligatory memorial, we celebrate that. But if there's no obligatory solemnity, feast, or memorial, uh, it's, a, it's optional, but given that we're oblates of the Virgin Mary, we try to do all we possibly can to promote Marian devotion. Okay. <coughs> Paul VI starts by highlighting Mary's presence in Advent. Advent is a very Marian period. which Mary is patiently awaiting the birth of her child. That's what Paul VI says. The Virgin Mary is patiently awaiting with great joy and hope the birth of her son. Okay, now in in the very heart of the Advent season, we have two enormous Marian solemnities. And this is usually in the very, the very heart, the very middle of Advent. It's December 8th. December 8th is the solemnity of the Immaculate Conception, which happens to be the patroness of the United States as well as the Philippines. Maybe the Philippines didn't know that, okay? Now you know it, okay? So she's the patroness of the United States, the Philippines, other countries too. Now four days later, we celebrate Our Lady Guadalupe, which technically the Macca Conception has a higher liturgical grade than Our Lady Guadalupe. Now, if you go to, uh, you go to Mexico, it's a solemnity. Right? Whereas, if we sell it during the week here, it's not a solemnity. Uh, John Paul II did proclaim her as the patron of the Americas. Okay. This I haven't written. Things are occurring to me. Uh, when you get old, you start to forget, no? December 10th, we celebrate Our Lady of Loreto. Have you heard of her? Okay, that is the house of Loreto where the Holy Family lived. And according to tradition, the house was transported to Italy, where it is to this very day. Loreto. That's where Jesus, Mary, and Joseph that's where Jesus grew up, and that's where Mary was with Jesus for 30, for 30 years. <coughs> okay, so we arrive at Christmas. Christmas, the center of Christmas is Jesus Christ. But Jesus was born of Mary. You can't separate the two. So Christmas is a Marian feast, of course. Jesus is, is the most prominent part of it. You can't celebrate it without looking at Jesus in the arms of Mary, right? Okay, then during the course of this Christmas season, the Sunday after Christmas, which was the day after Christmas this year, it happened to be the Holy Family. So in this we see Mary presented as essential and model role as the perfect mother and the perfect spouse and as a cohesive force that unites the Holy Family. Well written, right? I like that, a cohesive force. Uh, That's the opposite of dysfunctional, okay? It's like super glue, right? So she's the perfect wife, she's a perfect mother, and she's a cohesive force that, that 
that uh, unites that family. Joseph and Jesus too, of course. Then January 1st, January 1st, it's not only New Year's, but also January 1st happens to be the solemnity of Mary, the mother of God. And Pope Paul VI proclaimed it also the universal day of peace. He added that in his pontificate, Paul VI. Now, of all, the t- of all the titles that you can give to Mary, and she has a lot of titles. If you've ever prayed the, the litany of Loretto, the classical litany, you've got about probably 60 different titles for Mary, and they're very beautiful, very poetic. Many of them are biblical. Tower of David, the mystical role, is very beautiful if you like, like poetry, like mystical poetry. But the greatest... The greatest title for Mary is the Theotokos, which means the mother of God. So, okay, if you people want to honor Mary, the best way you can honor Mary is by saying, Holy Mary, Mother of God. That's what she likes best. (laughs) Called her Estella Matis. I mean, those are St. Bernard, right? Called her in those those titles, but don't forget the mother of God, and you say that in the Hail Mary. Every time you're saying the Hail Mary, you're, you're exalting Mary's greatest privilege. Mary, Mary, Mary has many privileges, but her greatest privilege is that she is the mother of God. Nothing greater than that. And if you think about that, how much power she has before God. And the, the, the power that Mary has before God is, as St. Thomas says, almost infinite. Okay, uh, <coughs> in, the, in the past, <coughs> today, uh, would be Epiphany of uh, January 6th. But the church celebrates the Epiphany. It would be the Sunday after Holy Family. The Epiphany. Years ago, I was uh, on the freeway and I saw, I saw a bumper sticker. And I really liked it. And the bumper sticker said this, wise men still find Jesus in the arms of Mary. I like that. So I had a couple of bumper stickers, but... I put it on my car, but it fell off, no? (laughs) Wise men still encounter Jesus in the arms of Mary. Okay, so that's uh, that's the presence of Mary in Advent and the Christmas season. So let's move into ordinary time. There are some months that have various Marian feast days. Others have less. So what I'm doing, I'm just going to be going through all the months and highlight the different Marian feast days. So that you, being aware of this, every, every month, every week, you know, okay, oh, this is a month of February. Ah, Father Rome said, yeah, yeah, there's, there's two Marian feast days nine days apart, which would be, February 2nd is the presentation of Jesus in the temple, which is the fourth joyful mystery. And it's the day in which the Holy Father wanted uh, religious to renew their vows. And that also happens to be also known as candle mass. Do you know why? You know, we, we never do it because of the pandemic, but also because if we give people candles, our workers are going to have to work a, a day in a year to get the, the wax off the, the, off the floor, as well as the kneeling benches. 
because that's 40 days after the birthday of Jesus, and it's when the prophet Simeon looked at Mary and said, he will be a light for all the people. Luma Gentium. He'll be a light for all the people. That's why it's called Candle Mass. Candle Mass. <coughs> okay. <coughs> February 11th, <coughs> we celebrate Our Lady of Lourdes, which Our Lady appeared to St. Bernadette 18 times. 18 times. And finally, St. Bernadette said, what is your name? And she said, je suis la Macalé Conception. In patois, she spoke the uh, French dialect of uh, St. Bernadette. And patois would be French dialect. Like Cebuano, okay? Or Tagalog. Okay. She said, uh, I am the Immaculate Conception. John Paul II proclaimed this the u- universal day of praying for the sick. I think it was 1992. You know why? Because Lourdes is where you have possibly the most miracles you have when the people go to Lourdes and the healing water of, Lu- of Lourdes. Father Greg Staub, some of you remember him, he passed away. He said something that, you know, when most of the miracles of healing are at dusk during the Eucharistic procession outside. See the difference? The the, the water is a sacramental, but the host and the monstrance, it is what? It's the sacrament of sacraments. Holy water is great, but all the water in the world cannot be compared to one consecrated host. So that's February 11th. Now I've often thought about this. If... uh, I were ever to be canonized, I, I know Philip Neri would play a practical joke on me. He would inspire the Pope to have me canonized on February 30th. <laughs> or February 29th. You know why? That's when I was born. And that will appear every four years. It'll appear in Lent, and I'll be brushed aside, no? (laughs) And Philip Neri say, hey, get Padre Escobita, give him, canonize him February 29th, okay? Okay, let's move into March. (coughs) I put in... Uh, this article, March 19th, which happens to be the Solemnity of St. Joseph. Uh, Technically, it's not Mary, but St. Joseph, do you know the technical name for that feast day? It's St. Joseph, the husband of Mary, so it is really a Marian feast day too. May 1st is Joseph the worker, but uh, March 19th is the Solemnity of St. Joseph, the husband of Mary. And I hope all of you, as a result of the year of St. Joseph, that your devotion to St. Joseph is not declining. Especially today, today, today have the, the saint in the church has spread most devotion to him in probably the whole Catholic Church. Before you had St. Bernardine of Siena, Francis Sales, Teresa of Avila, you know, a little bit. But this saint, his whole life was... He called him the little puppy dog of St. Joseph. El Perito de San Jose. So March 19th. Okay, March 25th, which happens to be my spiritual birthday, my baptismal day, which I take seriously. 
is the solemnity of the Annunciation, sometimes called the Incarnation. Why two different names? Annunciation is the angel announcing. Incarnation is what happened when Mary said yes. Jesus became incarnate in the womb of Mary. Two different facets of the same mystery. The announcing. Annunciation means announcing. Incarnation means taking on flesh in Mary. Okay, for your information, at March 25th, count nine months. You good at counting? Nine months, okay. April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, and December 25th. See the connection there? How many months is a baby usually a full term? We have some mothers here. I mean, it's a full term. It's usually about nine months, right? So here we have March 25th. Mary, it's called the virginal conception. Mary conceives Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. Nine months, nine months then, Jesus is born. Interesting. Okay, I wrote down in the article Easter. Okay, Easter is usually in, in April, and this is this is very Ignatian. Now, what I'm going to say is. Who did Jesus first appear to? Have any of you done the exercise with me? Who did he first appear to? Mary Magdalene? Okay, St. Ignatius in the Catholic tradition says Jesus first appeared to Mary. And he would basically say, do you not have reasoning? (laughs) Of course, he's going to appear first to his mother. She's the only one that didn't doubt. She knew he was going to rise from there. The others, they they were doubting. The the apostles, they went back to their fishing business, right? I'm going fishing. So I put that in April because usually Easter is in April. So we imagine Mary encountering Jesus when he rose from the dead. So let's move then from April to May. Okay, May is traditionally the month of Mary. St. John John Bosco, um, I have a lot of books um, on St. John Bosco. I really love John Bosco. For the young people, he would try to get them to do a special act, prayer, sacrifice, act of charity, every day in May. I kind of like that. Yeah, so every day in May, maybe this coming May, when we're we're still a few months away, try to do something special. I I could already suggest, read the glories of Mary. The best translation, his name is Billy, who was a, he he went to Dart with my my brother Mike, and he went on to become a redemptorist priest, and he's translating the Italian of of Alphonsus into English. So he translated the glories of Mary into English, and he's a superb translator. His name is Dennis Billy. That redemptorist priest, in one of the you know one of the Ivy League schools, he was he was pumping out vocations right and left. He formed what is called the Aquinas Club, and they would have adoration, they would pray the Rosary, and then these intellectuals they would you know, talk about Newman and in their free time, and and he helped these several of them to decide to become 
to become priest. And that priest on EWTN, who's the um, canon lawyer, was also a companion of my brother, Mike. I keep forgetting his name. He's always with Raymond Arroyo. And he's, a, he has a, I think, his doctorate in canon law. So May is the month of Mary. <coughs> May 13th is Our Lady of Fatima. So it calls to mind the first of the six apparitions of Mary to the children, Lucia, Francisco, and Jacinta. And her title in Fatima is Our Lady of the Rosary. Her title in Lourdes was I Am the Maca Conception. In Mexico, no soy yo tu madre. She defines herself in different ways in those three famous apparitions. Also, May 13th, 1917, was the day in which Jacinta and Francisco were canonized. A hundred years after the first apparition. It's also when my Marian consecration was published also uh, in, nine, in uh, 2017. Okay, May 31st, we celebrate the visitation of Mary to her cousin Elizabeth. the second joyful mystery. Father Dave Keeter, Father Greg Staub, and Father John Lyons were ordained on that day. They were two years ahead of me, 1984. Okay, now, we. it's interesting that there are no real formal Marian feast days in June, but in form, well, there, there's one. The Saturday after the feast day of the most sacred heart of Jesus, we celebrate the Immaculate Heart of Mary. But aside from that, there are no other Marian feast days in, in June. Okay, July, we have, we have one. So in the very middle of July, July 16th, we celebrate Our Lady of Mount Carmel. So on this day we call to mind Our Lady's request to St. Simon Stock, who was the Superior General of the Carmelites in the 13th century, that she wanted the wearing of the brown scapular as a sign of our consecration to her. So when we wear this with pride, the brown scapular of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, it's a sign that we belong to Mary. We are in the school of Mary. We are in the family of Mary. We are in the heart of Mary. So hopefully all of you, all of you wear your brown scapula. In my Marian consecration, I probably impose probably at least 10,000, right? <laughs> Maybe more, no? So make sure that you're always wearing your brown scapula. It's a sign that you belong to Mary. So that's the only formal Marian feast day in July. Then we jump to August. In August, there are actually two Marian feast days. <coughs> and it's, one is in the, the middle of summer and the middle of August. The middle of summer and the middle of August, which would be 
August 15th, we celebrate the, the Assumption of Mary into Heaven in body and soul. S some of you were, were, were born when this was proclaimed. It was proclaimed actually in 1950 for Pius XII. Munificentissimus Deus, the papal bull, proclaiming that Mary was taken up to heaven in body and soul. It happens to be the fourth glorious mystery, not to be confused with the second glorious mystery. All right, then, a week after that, the angels and saints are preparing for the big celebration. August 22nd is the fifth glorious mystery, which happens to be the crowning of Mary as queen of angels and saints. You see the juxtaposition is you have one after the other. August 15th and then August 22nd. This is a holy day of obligation. I've never, I, I've never really liked the terminology a holy day of obligation. I've always cringed at that. I've always, uh, I mean, that's the way we say it, but I've never felt comfortable with that, the way that that's phrased, because you know, we're, we're forced to go to church to honor Mary. I mean, that's, I don't like that. You know, like, you know, you're married and you, you know, I, I, under obedience, you must kiss your husband every month, okay? <laughs> under obedience. You know, you don't want to do it, but do it anyway, okay? <laughs> so, um, Holy Day of Obligation, that's the way it's put. But we should, all, you know, all these days that I'm mentioning, you should all want to go to these Masses and celebrate them with special flair. You know, say an extra rosary, uh, do a, a Marian meditation, bring someone to church. Maybe you have a Marian shrine in your home, you know, maybe light a candle and maybe incense. Not marijuana, but uh, you know, it can. And what you're honoring Mary in a very special way. So that's August 22nd. Now September, we've got we uh, September we got three Marian feast days. All right. Let's see. Let's, uh, let's test your math skills. December 8th is what? What? The Immaculate Conception, right? Count nine months. Okay, so you count nine months. September 8th, what do we celebrate? So it's Mary's birthday. So December... Eighth, and when Mary was conceived in the womb of Saint Anne, that's called the Immaculate Conception. So you count nine months. If you don't believe me, count. Okay. <laughs> December eighth, you arrive. It's September eighth, and very, very few people know Mary's birthday. Maybe you didn't know until I told you right now. I mean, and that's sad. How would you like it if? Your, your son or your family forgot about your birthday. You, you, you'd probably, I think you'd get angry. Hmm? You know, not even a Twinkie? No. <laughs> Twinkie and a candle? Come on. Well, we, we forget about Mary's birthday. Obviously, it's not as important as Jesus' birthday, but if Mary's born, Jesus is born to Mary. September 8th. You know, when you 
could do, I'm, I'm more and more thoughts are occurring to me. Um, July, you, know, you go back in your notebook to J July 26th. That's the, that, that, that's the feast day of the parents of Mary, which would be Anne and Joachim. Talk about underestimated saints. In Saint Anne, you have the Immaculate Conception. They're under, I, I think that should be a feast. If Mary Magdalene is raised to, to a feast, why not raise the parents of Mary to a feast? I don't have the power to do that, but I, I would do it. <laughs> Anything we can do to, to, to bring greater love and attention to Mary, let's go for it. Any of you ever been to uh, Saint Anne de Beaupre in, in Quebec? I think I was there 57 years ago, and I, I, I don't have a perfect memory, but there were so many crutches there because that's the place with St. Joseph we have so many healings. Patron saint of Canada is St. Joseph and St. Anne. And now St. Andre Bassett, he was just canonized 2010 by Benedict, Benedict the 16th. 16. Okay, so let's move back to September. September 12th, Is that an important feast day for the Oblates? <coughs> Do you know why? No. <laughs> you don't know why? That's when we made our first vows. That's when we renew our vows. That's when we made our perpetual vows. And it is the holy name of Mary. It's the feast day of the holy name name of Mary. Four days ago we celebrated the holy name of Jesus, right? Remember that? We celebrated the holy name of Jesus, uh, January 3rd, the holy name of Mary we celebrate on September 12th. If you'd like to honor that, pray the divine praises. Because the divine praises, you have a lot of uh, invocations to Jesus, but then there's a lot in which we're honoring Mary. And we say the divine praises at the end of the holy hour, right? All right. Do any of you know what we celebrate September 14th? is the exaltation of the Holy Cross. The following day, we celebrate Our Lady of Sorrows. Do you see the juxtap juxtaposition there? So the 14th, Jesus on the cross, is like a, like a mini Good Friday. And then the day afterward is we celebrate Our Lady of Sorrows. If you know the, the hymn of Jacoba di Todi, of uh, the Stabat Mater. It's a beautiful hymn. You got about, what, 20 different verses, no? I think it's Jacobi di Todi is the way they pronounce his name, singing the Stabat Mater. So there we have, uh, so three feast days of Mary in September the 8th. Happy birthday to Mary. The Holy Name of Mary the 12th. And then we have Our Lady of Sorrows, September 15th. Okay, now we arrive at the month of October. As May happens to be the month of Mary, so we have October which happens to be the month of the Holy Rosary. So that whole month is dedicated 
to the Holy Rosary. You see how, how rich our Catholic Church is? How rich? Will you, will you fall in love with the Church if we just go through this? And you fall in love with Mary. Hmm? The whole month we should do all we possibly can to you know, pray the Rosary, give out Rosaries, Rosary processions, Rosary coronations. My friends, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. I think all of us are going to see that once we make it to heaven, we're going to see how many times Mary prayed for us to get us out of difficult situations, to protect us, to defend us. We're probably going to see maybe thousands. We are in a pit of desolation, and all of a sudden there was a glimmer of hope. Hail, Holy Queen, Mother of Mercy, our life, our sweetness, and our hope. You know where that prayer came from? Blessed Herman the Cripple. <laughs> he was a, uh, I think it was Cistercian monk with tons of health problems. But he was a genius. When he was in the depths of despair, Our Lady appeared to him and said, Herman, Herman, pray to me. Hail, Holy Queen, Mother of Mercy, our life, our sweetness, and our hope. So that prayer was taught when he was cast into profound desolation. And Mary pulled him out. Of all the Marian prayers, my favorite is the Hail Mary, but then after, I love the Hail Holy Queen. I don't know about you. Then, then the Memorare. I mean, I love the Hail Holy Queen. And by the way, the glory, did you know the glories of Mary is a commentary on the Hail Holy Queen? The whole book is, takes like a word at a time, and St. Alphonsus explains it in great detail. The whole book is a big book. That was by far his greatest literary masterpiece. I mean, he wrote, it was very prolific. It was like uh, Mark Twain's Joan of Arc. Hmm? Did you know that Mark Twain, the very famous American author who wrote novels, Huckleberry Finn and Tom Sawyer, you've, you've heard of him, right? You read them in, you read them in the Philippines, no? But his, his greatest work was uh, Joan of Arc. This is, this is uh, um, um, Mark Twain, Samuel Clemens. So, October is the month of the Holy Rosary. The specific day in which we honor the Rosary is October 7th. <clears throat> you know why? Because in my Marian missions, I did my mission in two churches in honor of in um, Compton and East L.A. La Victoria. La Victoria. So, October 7th is Our Lady of Victory, also known as Our Lady of Lepanto. Remember that? It was through the intercession of St. Pope, Saint Pope Pius V, and in Europe praying the rosary around the clock, that there was a change in the wind, and the Christians were able to capture the chief admiral of the Muslims, and to kill him, and then their whole fleet was thrown into confusion, and the Catholics won. Otherwise, I have 98% Caucasian blood. Hmm? I would be a Muslim now. I'd be a Muslim, because they would have entered into Rome there, they would have take, torn down <coughs> the basilicas, turned them into mosques, and those who are of European blood, we would, we'd be Muslims now. So it's because of Mary and her powerful intercession. That's why we're here today. Okay, then we've arrived at November, the last month of, of the church year. November 22nd, we celebrate the presentation the presentation of the child Mary in the temple. This is uh, less known, probably not known by many of you, but uh, is uh, according to tradition, Mary was 
taken to the temple when she was young. She was presented there where she's preparing herself for her mission to be the mother of God. So I've gone through the whole liturgical year highlighting the different Marian feast days. Do you like it? So um, I'd like to say a Hail Mary and um, we'll, we'll give you a, an article that I wrote on this so that I, I hope that you all be able to memorize this so you know every month, okay, what, what Marian feast day is this month? And it's celebrated with a lot of, a lot of joy. Okay? Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among them, and bless the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners, now at the hour of our death. The Lord be with you. Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit.